<laughs> no. <laughs> it's ridiculous, no? It's like a monitor, like a computer computer monitor. Yeah, they're really crappy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to San Francisco Ballet's Points of View Lecture Series. I'm Pam Seek, and I'm the Community Programs Coordinator at San Francisco Ballet. On behalf of everyone at SF Ballet, thank you for joining us for the last Points of View Lecture of the 2022 season. Thank you to all our audiences, both in person and at home, for supporting SF Ballet throughout the pandemic. This season, we are pleased to provide this free points of view lecture series on Facebook Live and YouTube. Before the pandemic, points of view lectures were held in the War Memorial Opera House before Wednesday evening performances. This year, we're continuing that tradition and have offered a new points of view lecture online at 6 p.m. Pacific time before each Wednesday evening performance. The recording of today's points of view lecture will continue to be available to view online on SF Ballet's YouTube channel through the end of the season. For a full list of the schedule of this year's points of view lectures, as well as our other education and audience engagement offerings, please visit us at sfballet.org slash events. Before I introduce our host, Mary Wood, there is a bit of housekeeping. The event is streaming on Facebook Live and YouTube. We might have some time for questions or comments at the end from our online audience. As our panelists cannot see the questions or comments, however, when they are posted, we'll have a staff member review them and we can pass along the questions that are relevant to the discussion. Additionally, when commenting in the live chat, we respectfully request everyone to abide by our community guidelines, which can be found in the link in the chat. For today's points of view, I'm thrilled to be joined by dance educator, Mary Wood, who will be interviewing artists from the company to reflect on Dancing Swan Lake, one of the most recognized and iconic classical ballets. Um, Mary will introduce our three guests today. Principal dancers are Odette Odile Sasha de Sola, our Prince Siegfried, Max Cawthorn, and our Von Rothbart, Tiet Helmet. Sasha, Max, and Tiet, thank you so much for joining us for Points of View today. And I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Mary Wood. Mary is, uh, she's received a BFA from the University of Utah and performed for nine years with Ballet West under the di directorship of Willem Christensen. After relocating to San Francisco in 1975, she taught children's and adult ballet technique and ballet history at San Francisco Ballet School. She pioneered the dance in schools program and was the principal lecturer for community outreach efforts during the 1980s. She has moderated the Points of View program since 1986 and the Meet the Artist interview and frequently participates as a guest lecturer in varied audience engagement programs. I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and I hope all of our viewers are too. Uh, Mary, Sasha, Max T, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. And um, Mary, over to you. Thank you, Pam. And my own welcome to our audience tonight. This feels like a special conversation this evening because as Pam said, we've arrived at the end of the 2022 repertory season, made especially exciting by the return to live performances. And we're marking the close of the Helgi Thomason era at San Francisco Ballet with this Sunday's final performance. 
And we're doing all of that in the context of, and I hope you'll excuse the hyperbole here, everyone's favorite ballet, Swan Lake. I'm so delighted to be here and in conversation with these artists. So introducing them, first Sasha de Silla. <clears throat> she received her training at the Kirov Academy of Ballet in Washington, DC, was named an apprentice here in 2006 and became a member of the Corps de Ballet the following year. She was promoted to soloist in 2012 and to principal dancer in 2017. During her career here, she has danced in nearly a hundred classical and contemporary ballets. I'd love to know who counted that. Uh, originating roles in countless new works. She's on her way to achieving all of the important ballerina roles, performing to date Princess Aurora in Sleeping Beauty, Kitri in Don Quixote, Titania in Midsummer Night's Dream, the leads in Nutcracker, of course, Cinderella, the Sylph in Sylphied, and now Odette Odile in Swan Lake. Sasha, have I left anything out that I should have included? Well, I actually haven't danced the Sylph and Sylphie. I thought um, you were down to do that. No, no, I haven't danced that. I would love to, but I haven't had the chance to do that yet. But the other ones are correct. Yeah. <laughs> so that's on your list. Um, well, outside of San Francisco Ballet, Sasha has appeared in numerous international galas. And really fun fact, in 2018, a bilingual children's book based on Sasha's life called On Tiptoes de Puntitas was published. Did you author it? Did you collaborate on it? I collaborated on it, yes. So I collaborated with the author um, to obviously share my story and give the look and feel of the book. Um, but it was authored by C.V. Montesubio, Mexican author. That's just amazing. Well, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, moving to Teet. Teet Helmets was raised and received his early training in his native Estonia. He began his career as a soloist with Estonian National Ballet, being promoted to principal six months later. After dancing all the principal repertory with that company, he joined Birmingham Royal Ballet in the UK in 1999, where he created numerous principal roles, and then joined San Francisco Ballet as a principal dancer in 2005. Here he has performed the lead roles by my count in our entire classical repertory, as well as in so much of our neoclassical and contemporary rep, creating memorable principal roles along the way. And now it's a pleasure to watch you, Teet, widening your rep to take on the richness of the character roles that the rep has to offer. And it's a family affair now. Did we see the Helmet's name elsewhere on the cast list earlier this season? You did. Anything more you want to say about that? Uh, yes, my daughter got to dance in Les Sylphides, and um, she was one of the little puppies in, um, in the season. Well, it's going to be exciting to, um, I, I love the concept of dynasty, and it'll be great to watch, see if she can um, rise up, live up to that. Yeah. Um, the uh, other thing I, that was all I wanted to say about you now. We will get back to you. Um, and now, of course, Max Cawthorn. Born in Tucson, Arizona, Max received his ballet training at San Francisco Ballet School, <clears throat> entered the trainee program in 2011. Max, you entered the school here pretty young. Did you actually begin training here or did you begin training in Arizona and move here? How did that work? How did you get to sure. My family and I moved here when I was six. Um, so I sort of consider this uh, home and, you know, where I'm from, I, I have a pretty bad memory of just in general. So my childhood, I consider this home. Um, I started in the middle school when I was 11, uh, but I had been doing um, movement classes and, and sort of less structured dance classes at ODC. Um, uh, for probably three years before that. Uh, so age eight, um, started in level one here at 11 and then all the way through the school. That's really remarkable. I think we see that in some of the European academies or European style academies, but rarely in the American schools. 
And I think that might be um, unique to San Francisco Ballet. Do you think it, you are the only current dancer to go from level one to principal? I think, um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we, we've had several other students who have started in the school and have joined the company and stayed with the company for, for, for quite a long time. Um, Sean, Sean Bennett started in the Dance in Schools program, um, which is a fantastic program that the Valley School has. Um, and he's been in the company for, for, for probably about 10 years now. Right. Well, our school is, deserves to get a lot of recognition. Absolutely. Uh, moving on, in 2014... You did join the company after a year as an apprentice and then were promoted to soloist in 2017 and principal dancer in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a relatively new principal dancer promoted just as the pandemic was taking hold. Do you have a word or two to say about how frustrating that might have been? Oh, no, I, I didn't feel frustrated. I mean, you know, during the pandemic, it was... Uh, frustration. I, I never felt frustration. I felt um, quite honored. Um, I didn't, um, you know, my concern, and I, I expressed this to Helgi when he offered me my, my promotion, uh, was mostly for the security of the company um, and whether uh, promotions at a time like this is the right move necessarily. Um, but other than that initial sort of wanting to make sure everything else would, you know, still pan out, um just pure honor yeah well congratulations in any case thank you um so max has appeared in over 60 ballets in the SF ballet repertory has originated many new works danced leading and principal roles in thomason balanchine posikoff ballets and is just beginning to take on the principal roles in the classical repertory uh, we could maybe call the full length Liam Scarlet Frankenstein, the lead in a full length, I guess we could call it classical. And then we just saw you, and this I'm sure of, as James in La Sylphie, because I saw your performance <laughs> and enjoyed it. So um, anyway, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. So now I have uh, just questions about the ballet world for each of you. And I mean, I want all of you to answer this question. So we'll just kind of go around the room um, having performed in the San Francisco Ballet's renowned broad repertoire, you've performed both classical and contemporary works with neoclassical in there somewhere. Um, for each of you, do you have a preference? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Um, what can you say about perhaps the broader question is speak to the breadth of our repertoire and where is your your sweet spot in it. And I'm gonna start back with Sasha. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that I love about this company and I think has kept me so engaged with this company for so long is that repertoire that just is always shifting and like constantly challenging us as dancers. And that is such a gift as an artist because it really pushes you. and. Um, almost forces you to, to find different aspects of yourself as a dancer, as a human, um, as a performer. So I, it, it's a really beautiful thing. Um, I have always had an affinity to classical ballet. It's something, you know, I trained my whole life for that. So of course I love dancing classical ballet. That doesn't mean I don't like dancing anything contemporary. That's not true at all. But um, I find that they're so interconnected, one informs the other and the other informs the other. So it's it's kind of this constant um, shift of energies and uh, it's it's been interesting to kind of see how, sorry, I'm getting a call, um, how, you know, over time gaining more experience and um, having more opportunities, both in the classical and contemporary repertoire how those have, they, how much similarity they have as well. You know, I, I'll always remember um, when I was working with Natalia Makarova on Shades, Viadere Shades, um, she, would, she would say, well, this is just like all of the contemporary things you, you're doing now. It's the same thing. It has to have that same freedom, 
freedom, that same breath, that same kind of um, just pure freedom. It's just dance. And it's so true. I think sometimes there's a misconception that classical ballet is stunted or um, it's too rigid. And I don't think that's true at all. Of course, there are rules and there's a certain aesthetic and certain technique that you do have to achieve, which is extraordinarily difficult, but it has just as much breath and maybe even more of a spiritual quality to it that I, at least I connect with that um, in, a, in a classical repertoire. So that has always been um, something fascinating to me about classical ballet. Thank you. Pete, how do you answer that? Um, I would probably just echo a little bit of what Sasha was saying. Um, one of the reasons that I came to this company was that I actually came from a very structured, mostly classical ballet company in England, and I uh, was really looking forward to, to um, actually work with new uh, choreographers, create new ballets, dance new works that I would otherwise never get to dance. But there is, there is certainly some truth to what Sasha is saying, um, even in classical ballet, it is the certain kind of strength that the dancer has that makes that makes that dancer shine in the particular role in classical ballet. Same thing goes into modern works. And a lot of the times that we're very fortunate to have the choreographers come and then create works based upon your strength or the kind of qualities that you bring to the dance. And it's probably the origin of classical ballet <laughs> where Somebody had those strengths and the choreographer created those wonderful works that are classic now, which is, which is such a privilege. I feel really fortunate that um, we have a mix of both here, something that is being created at the same time as paying homage to the older works. And, and uh, yeah, in a, in a short, just think uh, that the repertoire and the breadth of repertory we have is really great. So Max, do you have a sense of that classical contemporary or somewhere in the middle? Um, you know, I think it's sort of been changing throughout my career. Uh, I think when I first joined the company, um, I preferred classical work uh, much, much heavier. Um, and of course, I still love classical ballet. I mean, that's what, you know, like Sasha and, and Teet have said, that's the, the basis of, of <laughs> that's our foundation. Um, but I found that sort of in that pursuit of um, that endless pursuit of trying to like master your body and master your craft um, that I've been really enjoying trying to see how far the limit goes um, in terms of contemporary work and, and contemporary movement, especially. Um, but, you know, I've, you know, I mean, we just did Swan Lake. Like, I love, I love both. You know, I mean, I, I, I feel very fortunate to to be able to to operate within both 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 realms. Yeah. Well, this broad repertoire, as I said, is renowned, and um, I'm hope, very hopeful that that continues. Um, so let's just get right down to Swan Lake. Um, this is the classics. Um, so for each of you, again, going around, what is your first memory of the ballet Swan Lake? A movie, a performance, learning a variation in the classroom, reading a story, your first memory. Let's go to, um, uh, Sasha, let's go back to you. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Florida uh, and I, before I started, professional ballet classes, structured ballet classes, uh, my mom would take me to see uh, what is now Orlando Ballet Theater at the time. It's called Southern Ballet Theater. Um, and that was the very first time I saw Swan Lake. I'll never forget it. I remember the score uh, just kind of took over me. I was so moved by it. And still to this day, I am moved by it every single time. It's crazy. Absolutely every single time. Um, and so I, you know, that's kind of the, the pinnacle of, of ballet. And then obviously since then I've seen it many more times and many more interpretations and um, in different versions and everything, but uh, it's, it's just, 
it stands out in your mind. I mean, I remember so clearly watching it um, and it's, it's such a special ballet in that way. It really touches you to, to the core. And I think that that's what's so beautiful about it. Max, do you have a memory? Well, I was gonna say, I think the first memory that I have of the story of Swan Lake is actually in the, uh, there's a, like a children's movie and an animated movie. I think it's called the, the Swan Princess. And it's basically the story of Swan Lake, right? <laughs> but I never, because I didn't, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't really like ballet. I didn't like watching it. I didn't, I was kind of, Jeff Lyons would always try to get my mom to take me to the ballet more. Um, and so the first, my first experience with the ballet Swan Lake was uh, in the new production, the production that we do now um, as a child. Um, but that, that was my first experience with the ballet itself. But the story I was a big fan of. <laughs> so what I'm hearing you say is that you actually danced in it. I did. As it was, it was, yeah, it's, this has been sort of like one of the, one of the fun little tidbits that we've been covering throughout this ex entire experience is being able to go back and watch the videos of me as one of the aristocrat children and then seeing other videos as peasants or, you know, like the bread vendor or, and then into aristocrats and then into divertissement and then in, now into Prince. So it's been a progression. That's the biography of a career right there. <laughs> <laughs> as we traveled through Swan Lake. So T, you have kind of a neat story about Swan Lake. What's your, what's your first experience of the ballet? And then when did you first appear in it? Um, the, the first time I actually saw ballet live was a Swan Lake uh, second act adagio. It was done for the opening night gala of uh, Estonian National Ballet. And, and back then there was just a wooden floor. There was no any fancy floor or anything like that. And I remember the pointures made so much noise and I was wondering like, oh my God, this is really like weird or like looking like so hard and wooden. I couldn't stop staring at her shoes because I was thinking, like, what are they made out of, like rocks or something? <laughs> and, and, and um, but yeah, I, I um, when I joined the ballet company in Estonia, right away, the, the company director decided that, that I should do Swan Lake, and I had a six-month preparation for Swan Lake, and then um, I performed it, and um, that was my first full-length ballet I did. And you were Prince Siegfried. Doing Prince Siegfried, yes. So that's sort of bypassing Max's experience and jumping right to the top. And then, as I understand it, you were promoted. Yes, yeah, I was. On the strength of that. Um, Sasha, you have been here since before this production, as I recall. So both you and Teet then remember the earlier production. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not here to do a compare and contrast between the two productions, mostly just curious, what other roles then have you danced? Um, like Max has done this, this, and this. Yeah, well, I haven't danced the children, but I danced the Swan Corps, um, and then subsequently um, the Swan Maidens, or the big swans, the tall swans. You never um, did the four signets? No, I never did. I'm a little bit too tall for that, I'm five, six. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I also danced, of course, the peasants in the first act, the aristocrats, um, the pas de trois, the Russian princesses in the third act, the chartists in the third act. I believe that's it. I could be missing something, but oh. I think that, yeah, a lot of the roles I've, I've danced, most of them. So T, we know you've danced um, two of the principal parts. Have, do, did you ever get tucked into any of the other parts? Variations or anything? Um, in Swan Lake, actually, um, I did do Pas de Tra quite a bit in Estonia and in, in uh, England as well. And that's, in, that's a little um, uh, different dismount in the first act. Right. And yeah, other than that, I, well, well, that's not completely true. Uh, when I first 
well, I first joined Estonian National Ballet. I did the the the, the core in um, in the first act of Swan Lake. So it was the big waltz, and it, it was apparently a big deal that I was able to go into that kind of core work. So I, I felt very proud of myself. Well, that question serves two purposes, really, looking back and looking forward, <clears throat> because um, for one, it speaks to how. Um, how the tradition, how our tradition, which is one of my favorite themes, is uh, very much embedded in you as advancing principal dancers, and how the tradition informs the work that you do in, as you mentioned, the contemporary works and the other classical works. And then looking forward, um, I guess this is something just a maybe a quick answer going around the circle, but has did all of those previous roles and all that previous experience with the production inform now your interpretation of the leads that you're performing thinking about that sasha i think inevitably um whether consciously or not right i i think about the the, um, the many, many performances I did in the Swan Corps and um, standing on the side and watching from the corner of my eye the principal dancers that were dancing that night, or even uh, if I couldn't see them being connected to the music. I mean, it's very difficult standing in B plus holding a position for a long time. <laughs> People realize that, but it is very difficult. Um, and so it, I've felt connected to the music, the story for a very long time, regardless of whether or not I had the opportunity to explore it as Odette Odile. Um, but I think, of course, it inevitably informed it, but I think um, when it came down to do it, um, I wanted to also find my own way and not just be a response to um, what has affected me, but rather find my own entry point into this ballet and, um, and, and, and really kind of make it my own within the limitations, of course, but in that, in that way. Max, how do you feel about that? Sim sim similar to Sasha, um, it, it feels like um, throughout your career, regardless of the ballet, regardless of how many years you were a part of Swan Lake um, in particular, I think you're constantly developing that characterization um, and sort of your own personality and understanding of, of what works for you, what works for the role. Um, and I think that that's, that's an important part of being able to, to, to tell the story, um, understanding what, what reads um, to the audience, um, what what makes sense in terms of uh, the pantomime, the 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 carriage of the of, of you know the, the the way you carry yourself on stage, um, things like that that you're always kind of refining and 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 working on. T, um, I'll inflect the question just slightly differently for you because. Um, I don't know if it would be tactful to put a number on how many years you've been associated with this ballet, but many. And I'm wondering if you could just pull out a couple of little nuggets of things that you have um, absorbed, have layered into your different interpretations as the years have gone by, as you've had different opportunities, different versions, different directors, et cetera. Wow. Um, what I really love is um, initially when I learned this piece and it was just the steps and it took a lot of sort of filing away and having danced with so many different Odets and, and Odiles um, um, in this ballet and just looking at the structure, the way that it's set up, um, there are all these stories and interpretations that everyone's had and I've just collected all of these memories and all of these experiences and I've just carried them with me you know um, always hoping to share it with somebody um, and and I, I just treasure all of these 
these experiences that all of these ballerinas and and principal men dance uh, male dancers have had in this ballet and I've, I've i've just like gobbled them all up and it's right now when i look at this ballet there's just it's just such a beautiful epic story and and the best part is just seeing somebody tackle these wonderful roles with their own mind and with their own freshness and it's been such a privilege just watching Sasha and Max tackle this role and watching all the other casts do it. It's so fresh and so <coughs> carefree and beautiful. And I'm just enjoying it. Um, and I think it's just such a treasure seeing new casts come on and do this. It's been amazing. That speaks a lot to say, to be able to use the, the concept of enjoying it. I, I love yeah. that. Um, turning to your actual principal roles in this, I will use the word once, iconic ballet. Um, Sasha, to the Swan Queen is both inside the ballet world and on the outside, the absolute epitome of the ballerina role. Who is Odette and who is Odile? No. As you as you've enveloped these roles. Yeah, so on the, on the most topical level, uh, Odette is a princess who is, unfortunately comes across an evil sorcerer, von Rothbart, and he places a spell on her where she becomes a swan by day and a woman by night, and only by, if a prince swears his true love to her and maintains that promise to her, will she be free of this spell. Um, but it, a little, with a little bit more depth to it, um, obviously Odette is this vulnerable, authentic creature that um, I find she's so layered. Uh, every time I rehearse or perform, her roles, uh, there's deeper and deeper layers to find, which I love. And um, it's also so highly dependent, what I've noticed is it's so highly dependent on the energy I get from, from Max, from Siegfried. Um, it's, it's both of those things, those energies. And um, so basically I think it's important that Odette you know, vulnerability is ultimate strength. And, and so Odette really has to communicate this. She knows that she is cursed and I, there's this kind of sadness to her um, because of that, but there's always a little bit of hope and um, she has to communicate that all of, all the time, this dichotomy of hope and and grief and despair and um that has to be communicated through her physicality the way she looks at the prince the way that she um runs everything um so there's a lot to explore with her um odile on the other hand is the daughter of von rothbard and she appears at the ball in the third act when um Siegfried is, is meant to meet Odette, but instead Odile appears and uh, she confuses Siegfried and uh, convinces him that she is in fact the swan that he fell in love with and turns out she's not. Um, so she's quite the opposite. So she's um, angular and spiky and strong in a different way and filled with tension and um, very obvious power, right? A very direct power. Um, and so it's quite a fun, fun role to play because of that. I'm sure any ballerina will say that. It's, it's that dichotomy that going from one extreme to the other in the matter of an intermission is, is really a challenge and so enjoyable in that way. Um, and just finding how to use your body to communicate all of those things in a short period of time is the most fun challenge of it all. That's I've written down the dichotomy of hope and despair because I'm 
I'll use that in a future lecture. That was mm -hmm. <laughs> lovely. Um, there's some more I want you to, I would like to hear from you, but I think I'm gonna go around. I, I don't want us to run out of time, horrors. Um, Max, there are scholars who say that this is actually Siegfried's story. Um, how do you respond to that? And who is Siegfried? So like I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a good ballet historian. So I, I do not know um, the validity of the statement that it's, that it's Siegfried's story, like legit. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's been working with Sasha and Teet has been nice because they both, uh, myself included, care so much about the characters and about the characterization and making sure that the story is cohesive first and foremost. Um, that we've had lots of discussions about how things should work and about the characters. And Sasha and I were doing this even after our first show. We had like an hour long conversation about about Siegfried and about the character and, and the characterization. Um, and to me, um, and this isn't the interpretation that a lot of people take, but I, we were joking that at least in first and second act, I kind of approach it almost as a golden retriever um, in the sense that he is so sweet and so kind that like in my mind if you're a royal the peasants don't aren't going to want to dance for you and the the children's aren't going to be trying to give you flowers and be overjoyed um if you're not kind and genuinely wonderful to them um and i think with the 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 shape of of, of a royal family that might have to come with this sense of sort of I'm just happy and I'm living my life. And like, I, I don't really think about this fact that, you know, my life is so drastically different than theirs. Um, that also lends itself to, to really believing um, in third act that, that, that Odile comes in and is, is, is genuinely uh, in love and trying to, trying to, to be this person being so overwhelmed um, and captivated with this, with this character that um, you don't really realize that the signs that she's sending are, are, are negative signs. Um, and it allows for that collapse, that sort of realization um, uh, that fall is, is greater. Um, so that's been sort of my, my way of, way of approaching it, whether that is Siegfried's story or not. <laughs> is not something I could really answer. <laughs> Someday, maybe you'll tell a different story. I know there are <laughs> yeah. um, occasional interpretations uh, in which Siegfried is a, is a more arrogant, entitled prince. And his going off to shoot swans is a very um, aristocratic thing to do in, you know in taking us back in history and that then of course that contributes to the tragedy when uh, he is humbled your mm. interpretation I think um, kind of lends itself to explaining the gullibility of the prince who can be bamboozled by mm. the character of uh, Odile that's really interesting and I definitely relate to the golden retriever thing I tend to use dogs as my illustrations for most things. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and I think it also just works for my personal interpretation of it. I would have a harder time going on stage and not smiling and not, um, you know, I, I, I'm on a stage full of my friends. So it's, it would be harder for me to be kind of arrogant and mean to these people. So it's easier. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to seeing your interpretation in 10 years from now, see how it's- me too. Or, or maybe change. Um, T, we were speaking together just a year ago about the Ballet Swan Lake. We were focusing on your role as Prince Siegfried at that time, and now we see you in the role of the villain at 180 degrees. Um, so who is the Baron von Rothbart? And some of your approach to Speaking of dichotomy, how you approach being the villain instead of the hero. I think that Von Rothbart is a great role. And 
to put it into animal sense, I would say that he is like a cat doesn't want to be touched and will hiss at you and will have the claws out. And so not like a golden retriever at all. <laughs> um, um, I think it's really interesting the kind of spell that he's put on, on Odette where she has to fight that kind of environment where she is in constant danger. And uh, during the day to have to watch out, people might be hunting her. And so it's a real, real curse. She has no downtime ever. So it's no wonder that she's so freaked out when she meets um, Siegfried. And, but that just goes to kind of speak on his character, the kind of person that he is, the kind of stealth that he casts on people where they have to live in a constant fear. And, um, and uh, I would say that he is um, um, a very sort of a, tr a troubled man. He enjoys watching other people suffer um, it's hard to sort of go into that kind of area as a character. Sometimes I just let the steps allow me to take there. And then other occasions, I, if the steps don't quite take me there, I try to sort of dive deeper of how can I feel this character? How can I embody it? And, um, it's, it's been really fun. It's been really fun. Um, sort of getting to know the layers of this particular character. This is not my first time I'm doing this, but it's it's still already this like second time around now doing this. It's um, it's been really enjoyable. And also in an inferred act of trying to find these instances where so whenever I I um, have done it with the ballerina, I sort of tried to um, adopt some of their movements of just show that kind of um, family resemblance or maybe there are some moments of family resemblance so like watching Sasha I tried to just pick something out that can become like the theme that maybe has been carried through the family that she suddenly just sort of shows so I just adopt some of her mannerism in a very slight way just to show that kind of, uh, or be a slight giveaway of his attachment or who Odile really is. That's fun. I would like to watch for that. I'm afraid you, you all are on again Friday night. Is that right? Yes. I don't know if I can be able to make it. Um, I have seen versions in which Rothbard has more or less actual dancing, actual choreography, and in which uh, um, a more senior character dancer takes the part and does not do grand jetés across the stage. Um, I wonder if you, what kind of leeway do you have in terms of um, between the actual choreography of leaps and partner work uh, and drama, evilness? You know, it is, it's very hard uh, because in the character roles, you often want to be weighted down. You want to be heavy, you want to step with heaviness. And, and it's, it's hard to find that, that sort of, when you jump, you're a light, but you find that kind of weight in your jump. And so um, that particular aspect of physicality of Rothbard becomes very difficult because especially in fourth act where the whole, the storm is happening and the, the fighting is happening. It can't just be um, quick. It has to be still that same weight. There has to be a lot of weight happening. He can't just be whacking his arms around and flapping wings. They have to have a certain kind of confidence and strength all the way through it. And it's very hard to do when you're tired at the end of um, the very, very end of the ballet. And you have dancers who are already been killing themselves and then you're suddenly like pulling them around and tossing them around. So you have to be also very careful of not going with too much force in. So it's a really fine balance in being a team player and also uh, portraying the character at the same time. That's an interesting perspective, being a team player. Um, unfortunately, I haven't saved time for you to discuss the technical challenges of these parts, which are on the one hand legendary um, on the other hand, having watched you all over the years in other roles, 
um, you are more than in command of what you're asked to do in this, these, well, this particular ballet, among others. Um, so congratulations on that. I'm going to ask, because we're down to within a minute or so, if um, our hosts have been monitoring the chats, is there anything that came up in the chat that would serve as a kind of playing us out question? Yes. Hi, thank you so much. This is so wonderful. Um, one viewer commented, so first of all, there's a lot of love in the chat, but um, a viewer commented that all three of you gave such emotional and powerful performances in Swan Lake. How do you calm your mind after a performance ends? That might be a lyrical way to, uh, I know that Max and Sasha had an hour's conversation <laughs> about mm -hmm. interpretation. But maybe more specifically, when you finish the performance, the curtains come down, the audience has finally stopped screaming. What do you do? Max. Um, I feel like usually for me, it's just like I take probably about an hour of comatose. Um, I can honestly sit in my chair in my dressing room, like just drinking water for probably about an hour, um, sort of like spacing out. Um, it's kind of crazy um i think you're at that point of exhaustion where you're kind of um i don't really feel like i'm still in the role i feel like i'm sort of on my way out yeah i somebody recently asked me a similar question of how do i care for myself and my body after doing a full-length ballet and what i expressed was that generally it's i'm more emotionally exhausted than i am physically exhausted although i am very physically exhausted but um <laughs> I, I struggle a little bit to get to release characters. Um, and it's, I don't know, they stay with me. It's, it's hard to let it go. Um, but I think one of the things that I do in general after I perform anyway, is I, I kind of review in my mind what it was because when I'm, when I'm dancing, I'm not, um, actively thinking, if that makes sense. I, it's more coming from a feeling place rather than, um, you know, like an analytical place. And so I don't really remember what I do uh, until later. And so generally I, I try to just think back on what I did, uh, think about also how I'll, I want to build on that and how I can make the next performance better. And then as much as I can release it. Um, but I have to admit, maybe someone in the chat has some good <laughs> suggestions how to do that. I, I struggle to release characters, to be honest. Um, so it takes more time than just an evening. It, I'll probably release it like in a couple weeks rather than, um, rather than like. Keith, with more experience, what is oh, yours? Yeah. The rough part is not so bad. I can I can finish the show. I'm tired. Um, unless somebody comes to see the show, I might discuss some of the aspects of it afterwards. Uh, generally, winding down after the show is always difficult, even if there is non-character dancers, uh, none none like a narrative story um, to calm down. Um, I usually just um, you know try to drink a lot of water, maybe take a melatonin so that I could just fall asleep. Um, but uh, yeah, like if, if something like, you know, I remember doing Secret, it was really hard. It's really hard. And it's just kind of like what Max was saying, you just sort of stare into space and you just, you know, you're just giving everything and um, you just eventually um, find your way out of the theater and home. But it mm -hmm. just seems like you're just kind of like, everything is just sort of numb around you, yeah. Well, it's been really delightful to hear from each of you. I want to congratulate you on an incredible season. I, in all of my time at San Francisco Ballet, I don't think I've seen the company look as consistently high quality from beginning to end. Each of you in all of the different roles that you've performed. Uh, it's just, it's been, it's, I, I always swear I won't use the word amazing. It's been amazingly wonderful <laughs> but thank you thank you again for this evening's chat and thank you for this season and i'll turn it back to pam for 
saying goodbye to our audience. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to Max, Sasha, T. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you also for providing a deeper understanding and insights into Swan Lake. Bravo to each of you for the entire 2022 season. And thank you so much for being here for Points of View. To all our online viewers, thank you for watching and listening to this Points of View and for your support of SF Ballet. I hope you all have an opportunity to see Swan Lake. Visit us at sfballet.org or our YouTube channel to view this POV again and any of the past season's POV lectures as well as last season's. On behalf of San Francisco Ballet, we wish you and your families good health. Thank you for being here during this time and have a wonderful summer. And we look forward to seeing you again at the ballet. Bye. Thank you so much.